Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to break down this terrain that I've created. Um, it's a, a rugged terrain inspired by the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And uh, we're going to look at how this terrain was constructed and how you can combine different elements and uh, uh, create a more sophisticated terrain um, uh, by separating the individual elements. Then we're going to take a look at how we can layer the textures on this and um, explore something uh, in more detail that I've covered before in a previous video, which I like to call dead zones. And that'll help us texture things more realistically. And then lastly, we'll take a look at how we'll create uh, a geological style map for this, uh, for this terrain using the cartography node. So let's jump in with the basics. Let's look at how this terrain was created. So let's start here first. I'm gonna lower the brightness so we can see. Um, so we start with this basic mountain, uh, just a random one. And then on top of that, I've added fold, which turns it into something like this. So what I was basically going for was I needed a, a, a central ridge line. So to create that, what I've done is uh, I've pulled the range really close, like it's 7%, and then I uh, pulled the midpoint to the left, so minus 70%, and that's what's creating this ridge line and, and then the extreme folding value up here, and then the angle, uh, uh, the folding, is easy we basically just want lots of broken structures so extra folding helps um, scale and angle were kind of found by experimenting just to see what fit this shape the, the most and then finally uh, i turned on min down here in the um, in the post process stack because i didn't want to have things jutting out and changing the shape too much from the initial mountain shape that we have so you can see while the details have changed the general um, uh, area that it covers, it remains the same. And then we have fractal terraces. So I'm using this to create a bunch of terraces here. Now I am using a new version that's shipping with Gaia 1.3, which is currently in development, but you can use um, the existing fractal terrace node. Um, all you need is a bit of harsh terracing here and there. And then I've also, uh, turned, uh, also turned on the min mode here so again, we're kind of like keeping the collapsed bits only and we don't want too much terracing everywhere. So with the min mode, we just get these larger terraces. Then we erode the whole thing. And for that, um, you can see most of the settings are as it is. Uh, I do have high down cutting and um, random sedimentation and that's what's helping us get these deep grooves uh, and then again, I've turned on min mode. So you can see there's a pattern here. Basically, what I'm trying to do is to just keep the collapsed areas so that we don't have to add them afterwards um, to make the whole terrain look more rugged. Now, for the next erosion pass, I'm actually creating a flow map first. So with this flow map, uh, I'm actually not using the um, the erosion output. I'm instead using the the flow data uh, data map, where I can control where the uh, the majority of the flows happen. And so in this, I'm going for secondary and tertiary flows, and I'm using just quarter uh, quality. So it's very fast and it's wide and doesn't really care about the details, which is exactly what I need because then we pass it as the area input for the second erosion node. And here you can see I've changed the settings quite a bit. First of all, I'm using selective processing and uh, precipitation, uh, or rather the area effect is precipitation amount. So what happens is rainfall and therefore erosion occurs more strongly where the flow uh, mask is. And then I have high volume, high base level, lots of inhibition. All of this is to create more flowing material. I do have a bit of down cutting, but the strength is very low softness is a bit low but duration is high so it just basically forces the erosion to occur for a longer period therefore creating better flow structures so now you can see it's created this river 
system here and this here, this here, and then here. So, and of course, several of them here. So now that's where uh, we get a bit more character in the, uh, the mountain, because here, if you see it, it's, it's really looking good, but it is somewhat generic. And so to add that extra uh, character, we use the flow structure for further erosion, and then we get these. Now next, this is still quite smooth, so to speak. So we use the surface node to add a bit of sharpness and a little bit of edge cutting just to roughen it up. Then we use the shear node. Now this uh, look dev node is really important here because this is what we're using to break up the, the mountain. So up until here, it's again, even with this extra erosion, it is still somewhat uniform and it is quite clean and there's not enough randomness, um, especially what we might find in nature somewhere. And here the goal is to create something really rugged, um, a terrain that's been through a lot from whether it's um, tectonic forces or other types of weathering. Um, so using shear, we can get that while retaining most of the qualities of the initial terrain. So here you can see we still get the general flow from here and here, and then the flows down here. But then this side has been um, just pushed around. It's, it's sheared. And so that creates a, a, a look of um, tectonic forces and upheaval and that kind of thing. Now, our terrain for the mountain is almost ready. The last thing we do is add a canyonizer. Now, the great thing with the canyonizer is it's not that visible here yet. But if I go back and this, you can see the terrain has gone down, but there's lots of these uh, patches that have been pushed down. So basically a canyon was attempted there. And there are several uh, several of these. Now, if uh, I had used uh, normal depth um, and uh, just use it normally on a flatter surface, that would have created canyons. But what I've done here is I've increased the number of octaves to 17, and then I've reduced the maximum depth to just 2%. So it tries to create canyons, but they are very, very shallow. And so we don't get canyons, we just get a rugged, a broken terrain. So that's what's uh, giving us, let me zoom out a bit so you can see. So these lines, these other lines here, that's what we're getting uh, from the canyonizer. And from the side, you can see that adds a lot of nice roughness in these cutouts, which break up the silhouette and give us uh, these extra shelves. Later, when we do other things like snow for example that's when those come in really handy now our our mountain is ready but we need the rest of the environment so for that um we have a ridge the ridge has been um, modified just a little bit so i have a really high definition value so it's creating lots of details and then i have warping or displacement turned on here uh, the amount is is High, but the scale is somewhat low and so that br uh, breaks up the the slightly straight lines of the ridge node by adding these undulating um, uh, uh, warps and then as a uh, sort of a, a gentle uh, pleasant side effect we get these terracing like patterns so you get that for free with uh, with just displacement and then add, uh, that just adds to the whole feel now just like we did with the uh, the mountain, we're going to use a canyonizer here. But of course, here I'm using normal depth, which is 20%. Um, and that you can see it's carving out these canyons. And these canyons are where we'll fill this with water and turn this into a lake. And so when we do cartography or, or just looking at the lake normally for a simple render, the coastline looks really good because this is similar to how normal uh, uh, lakes and other formations would form uh, with, with the canyonization. So you can see the edges here are shaped really nicely. 
you know, you have lots of clean shores in a way, but at the same time, it's quite rugged. And this is exactly what we need for this really rocky mountainous landscape. Now, because we're using narrow um, uh, canyons, in the high region here, we're getting this really nice one. Uh, you, if you don't get one, you can change the seed um, or try a, uh, a separate uh, canyonizer and then mask that area maybe. But the idea is um, to have like a few different kinds of um, uh, uh, terrain properties. So here we would have like a canyon or a little um, um, a gorge of some sort. Then we have the lakes here and then we'll have a big mountain here. So uh, uh, adding a bit of variety definitely helps bring out the realism. Now, we're going to shear this as well. And so you can see with shearing, we get a lot more character on the coastline. And that's broken up. We get these um, overlapping shapes. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what you, might, you would find in many places where you have a rocky coastline. And then because shear only shifts things and it doesn't transform everything, we still retain more or less of the original coastline. So if you go back, you can see the most of it is still there, just certain bits are sheared. And we're also getting some staggered shapes um, similar to the coastline, but up here, which help create this canyon area and the little plateau here. It's not exactly a plateau, but whatever this flat area is, it makes it look a bit more interesting. Now, um, just like the other one, we're gonna add surface just to sharpen this up and just add a bit of roughness to everything. Uh, that does make a big difference often, especially um, if roughness is your goal. And now I'm just going to use a max combine to merge them together. But because I want to change the placement of the mountain, I've interjected a transform node um, here. So basically I took this thing here and with the transform, I moved it a little bit to the side here. So you can see, it went from the center to here. And because I'd used canyonizer and I'd started with um, just a simple mountain, the edge is already clean. So when I combine them, it's not really uh, destroying any of the other shapes from the, from the ground that we have created. And so that is all that's required to create this terrain. And you might be wondering about this canyon mask. So because I want to use the canyon for certain things later on, uh, I've created a mask for it. And you can create a mask of any feature, even if the node doesn't allow it, by simply taking the node before it and then the node's output itself uh, and use a combined node and give it 100% difference. And so what we get here now, um, if I go to the 2D view and switch off, so that's kind of like the general shape and depth of the, of the canyons that have been created. It's just uh, an inverse. Now I've also auto leveled it um, just to make it taller. And then we'll come back to this a bit later. Now um, let's go to color production where we take this terrain further. So uh, now that the general terrain is ready, we need to have snowfall and so with snowfall what i've done is uh pretty simple I, I didn't want to have like too much snow um so i had like a lower intensity a bit high settle and thaw just so that it would roll down and fill these crevices i had a high melt so that it would just again melt the snow not have very large volumes and of course the snow line makes sure that it's only up here um, I also had a low adhered ma snow mass uh, value, and so that way um, the snow would fall down and uh, just not stick to the rocks that much. And then that's pretty much it. Oh, and I changed the snow output to a hard mask. And so that's our snow. Then we add lakes. And so for lakes, because I wanted them really low and I didn't want them to puddle up here or anywhere else where lakes could potentially form, I turned off precipitation and I turned on flood control and just added 1% water floor. So the bottom 1% of the terrain is now filled with water 
and there isn't that much um, extra precipitation going on and that's about all i need from the lakes so that takes care of all the physical changes we would do to the terrain itself and so now the rest of it is just um, texturing so for texturing uh, to create a really um, interesting and realistic shape or rather um, texture it's important to figure out how certain things would work in nature and so if we have snow it's not enough to just not have trees and grass where the snow is which um, in other words would be you use the snow mask to exclude trees or any kind of vegetation from growing growing in that area um, that's fine but we need something a bit more sophisticated so what I like to do to create these dead zones especially for snow is I create a separate snowfall node which is not used directly but its mask is used for um, creating the dead zones and so with that you can see I have changed certain settings to make it uh, flow a lot more um, this is a bit physically inaccurate but it's exactly what we need um, for uh, for creating these dead zones to, to get um, snow to flow down where it normally would um, so when I say physically inaccurate it's not that this isn't snow it's just that I've changed the physical properties of the snow so if I have all this high verticality um, snow flows more freely uh, I have zero adhered snow mass so it doesn't stick to anything and then the settle thaw is 100% so it just it takes advantage of that and flows down. Um, and again, I'm not too worried about this uh, being inaccurate because it's still using ge the general um, uh, flow physics uh, from Gaia's physics engine. So it still gives us a, a fairly accurate portrayal of where snow might go or what other kinds of um, uh, impressions snow might leave that would uh, prevent vegetation from growing there so that's just one of several so what I've done is I have this node here it's just a multi combine I just renamed it to dead zones and I'm using multi combine to uh, combine a bunch of different things together to create this entire dead zone so what you're seeing in white is where trees are going to be discouraged from growing uh, so let's look at these individual zones so we have height so we of course don't want trees to go way up here on the peak for several reasons one um, with a very tall peak that normally wouldn't happen the other thing is for artistic purposes we really don't want um, the 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 most attractive piece the the silhouette of the mountain to be covered up with trees that then we can't see um, also to break this up a bit what i've done is i've turned um I've you know, set up my um, uh, mask and then I've turned on displacement with a very low scale and 100% displace. So what that does is it just breaks up the edges, makes it a bit non-uniform. That's really important because otherwise it just looks like a flat cut on the edge uh, and that's really not attractive. Second, we have slope. Slope is pretty much straightforward. It's just the, like the top 5% the steepest 5%, nothing should grow there. That's important. Uh, and then another flow map. The flow is added to the dead zones just so that places where strong flows can happen. Again, I'm, I'm using secondary only uh, for these flows, but I've set the quality to half, so it's a bit more detailed. It's um, hugging the shape of the terrain um, more accurately than the other one that we used that which was just for ma simple masking purposes so uh, and that gives us all the dead zones that we need now in case you're wondering what these dotted lines are uh, when you want to connect to more than these first three nodes you can use the hidden ports in the multi combine and you do that by dropping the uh, the connection line straight on the node and then selecting one of these I'm not going to do that right now it's already connected but th um, that's how you access those hidden ports so that's now the dead zone that's going to the tree nodes which we're not going to cover in this because it's still work in progress and what you see is not what you're going to get 
Um, in fact, some of these dead zone features will be integrated into the um, the the arboreal nodes as well. So you won't have to set these things up manually. Plus, we'll take care of a few extra physics things that we can't get from these nodes directly. But together, what we want for growth patterns can be um, written straight into the algorithm. So again, we're not going to look at the tree nodes right now. That's that's really not that important. We're going to focus on the terrain. And then we'll just look at what it looks like with trees afterwards. So that's the dead zone created and done. Um, uh, and the portal's going out elsewhere. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, the first thing we're adding is the lake's uh, mask. So we want the entire surface of the lake to be excluded because the last thing we want is for trees to be growing in the center of the lake. Uh, and so with the snow, height, slope, lakes, and flow, we have our complete dead zone mask. Now let's look at texturing. So one of the components that um, we'll use is minerals, but I wanna come back to that later because that takes us on a separate path. Um, so we have a texture, simple texture, mostly just defaults really don't um, care what it is because we're just going to use a very simple sat map for this um, in real life large scale terrains rarely tend to be that colorful so in fact we want something muted and nice and somewhat uniform so it doesn't distract us and then that way other parts of the the texture can take over and give it that really good character so we take the texture and combine it with the mineral map uh, i'm just going to turn on the 2d viewport to show you what we're getting you can see there are some patches and whatever. And so what we're going to use for the geological map that we'll create with the cartography node, I'm using that as an influence for the sat map as well so that we can have some minor um, coloration difference based on where certain minerals are. Now, this is very arbitrary. None of this is um, physically or scientifically accurate because we're not creating something for science, we're creating something for artistic use. And so here you can change it however you like. So anyways, we take this combined mask and we give it to a set map. And then after hunting for a few different maps, I finally settled on 146 in the Rocky library. So you can see we're getting this map, the mountain uh, and if I just use the simple texture, this would look a bit too uniform, but because there's a mineral influence coming in, so there's a patch here that's different, uh, uh, and it's not really obeying the the uh, altitude, but rather the, the influence of the texture and mineral map combined. So there's another patch here. Our canyons, which are also an influence, as you will see, are uh, you know, are being colored separately as well. So that gives us our basic ground texture. Next, uh, we're going to add vegetation because even if we add trees on top, we still need to have um, green patches to represent grass. So for that, I'm just using a simple vegetation node. Um, you can see the settings here. We do have high occurrence and density to create these strong patches. A bit of chaos. And I've turned on jitter so that the the uh, well, there's basically randomize, uh, further randomization gives us larger dots as well from the um, and the jittering. And so that gives us our grassy fields. Uh, let's not worry about the lake because that will automatically be subtracted later. But basically, so that gives us our um, second layer. So the first layer is, of course, the ground sat map. Then we have the vegetation on top. Then the next thing, we create the debris flow. So when we did the flow mask here, uh, we can use that data to create certain um, debris flow as might happen uh, in real mountains where things break up up top and then flow down and um, create all these nice um, uh, flowy structures with the rock and debris. So to create the coloration for that, we don't really need something that distinctive. So what I've done is I've just created this tiny Perlin noise. So you can see that's what it looks like. If I zoom in, those are the patterns. And so I use low octaves because we don't really need that much detail inside. 
uh, I have high warp frequency, a small scale, and then the scale X and Y have been pushed to 100. So that gives us this tiny crumply noise, and that's perfect for what we'll do with it with sat maps. So when we get sat maps on that, that's the texture it creates. And from afar, it looks just like um, debris. Now, if you uh, render at much higher resolution and then you feel like, oh, these are too much like wavy lines and not um, uh, little splotch uh, splotches and dots, then you can just add a noise modifier after Perlin and you can get extra noise. Now, we're going to combine the, the two layered uh, ground and vegetation with this and we're going to use the flow output um, for a shaper node where well, actually, I just use the shaper as kind of a, uh, a placeholder, really. I was initially going to use shaper to broaden these, but as I was experimenting, turned out, you know, broadening it really killed certain texture components. So I just kept it, but used the multiplier or the rays, and the, the rays multiplier was set to three, and I turned on clamp so that it would brighten everything. But instead of taking the whole value three times higher, it would still clamp it to just 100% or 1.0 in technical terms uh, under the hood. And so with that, we have a really nice mask of where the debris should go. So with that, if you look at this, our ground and um, uh, grass texture, those layers have, have been now punctuated with these flowing debris. And in this, you can see the color difference better because we had the mineral map underneath. So we have these little yellow rocks uh, are, uh, are poking out and then we have the white debris flowing down, uh, little patches of different colors everywhere, but still with the uniform whitish rock, uh, the gray rock coming down everywhere. Um, it helps delineate the different shapes, um, looks a bit pleasing to the eye and the viewer can easily identify the different elements. Now, let's uh, take a look at the next one, which is where we take the tree nodes output and we just combine it for the extra vegetation because um, the shapes that we're going to get, let me turn that on here with the tree output. Uh, again, we'll cover all that in a later video when the arboreal nodes are finalized. So we now have the, the, the trees there's a bit low resolution, so if you're not seeing too much right now, but you can uh, see the, the darker color of the trees coming in. So um, if I go here, you can see that's what trees would look like without the tree color. So we then add the tree coloration. And then finally, we um, add the, the lake. So for the lake, um, this was pretty simple. Uh, we just take the lakes nodes um, depth output and I created this simple uh, gradient ramp and clutter. Uh, for the values, you can see it's this, this, and this. I pretty much tried to stay in the same hue. Uh, didn't want too many color variations. And this you can adjust and ramp down like wherever you want. Like if you have too much of this, it looks like it's transparent water, but if you have like, I personally don't like it to be this much because we're, you know, really high up. And if you can see that much, it then messes with the scale. So I would prefer something more like this so where there's a, a hint. Um, I can even bring this in further there. So there's a hint of, uh, you know, subsurface scattering, but not that much. Something like that will do. Uh, and, and also, as you can see, I'm not really worried about uh, where the edges are. I'll just color the whole thing. And then we'll use the lakes lake mask uh, and combine it with the previous color map. So then we get both of these. And there, that looks good. Finally, we bring in the snow. And that's our general terrain. Let me turn off the 2D view so we can see this in detail. And so that's our entire uh, mountainous landscape done. So you can see we get lots of good detail on the rock. 
um, we get uh, several layers of vegetation and we get water and everything in and we got to develop the two um, elements which is the main uh, area or the ground as you might call it and the mountain separately and then now you can move it around like we could go to the transform node right now move this here and then it would change everything in fact we can try that in a bit so now let's look at some of the things that we didn't cover yet which is the mineral map now this um, if you're not too used to Gaia this might be a little bit difficult to wrap your mind around but keep in mind that everything is based on height maps and so for the minerals um, which is going to be in cartography we just wanted something um, that doesn't really care what's actually happening to the terrain and just brings in its own random shapes. So here's how we do it. First, we have a Berlin, basically something large um, with auto level so that it covers the full height range, like so. Um, and when you're seeing this in 3D, it really doesn't matter because in essence, what we're creating is a 2D map. So this is what we're creating. Then we combine that using the screen method uh, with the, uh, the canyon output from before, or sorry, the final terrain output from before. Uh, so that gives us the, the general height of the terrain itself. Let me turn on 3D. So there we have the height. Uh, uh, because we're using um, auto level, it really brings it all the way up. And again, we're using auto level here and in Berlin because we want it to cover the entire height range from zero to one. So those two are combined uh, with screen and then we use the clamp uh, down here in the post-process stack to bring it down to 38%. So we want this to be like this. It was important to auto level them so they would both fill the full height range and then combine them down so they would be consistently scaled down to this. So this is the base of our mineral map. Then we create another Berlin, but this time you can see I have a high warp and a low scale um, and then a lot of post-processing. So first of all, we're using Shaper to bulk this up so the Berlin becomes fat and takes up all this space. Then we use a clip and bring down the minimum so that the ground starts disappearing and then all we have are these peaks. Then we auto level it and uh, I don't think we really need clamp. I think I turned that on by accident. It's not doing anything, it's fine because it's set to zero and 100. So if we auto level this as well, as you can imagine for the same reason, because we want it to fill the same height space when we combine it. And so when we combine it with the previous map, we get this. So we get a little bit of the original terrain. We get some of the Berlin that we created before. So that's the chaos. And then we have these very structured chaotic shapes added on top. To that, we're finally going to add the canyon mask. And so when we do the canyon mask, again, I'm doing add. And so that's also bringing it up. And so that gives us all these different heights and all these things at different heights are going to portray different minerals. And I'll explain that in a moment, but the idea is for each layer of mineral or type of mineral, we'll go and create a different height. That's why first for the general purpose stuff, where we don't have too much variation, we combined the first two at full auto level and then squashed it down. Then we added a, a, these Berlin stacks to make it tall. And then we added the canyon structures to, um, to mess with the edges of um, the canyons that were created with the canyonizer. Now, uh, this will make more sense in a moment when we look at cartography. So instead of passing the normal terrain, we're passing the canyon or the, the, the processed mineral mask to the cartography node. Now this will seem counterintuitive at first, but the thing is, we don't really worry about how it's going to look in the viewport. We just want the map itself to be created in a specific way. So now when I go to cartography, now what I see underneath as the terrain is whatever I have set as 
uh, the underlay and here it's the tree output now I don't care about the trees right now so what I need is the lake output which is kind of like the final stop on the terrain train um, god I can't believe I said that um, so anyways I'm just going to go press G on this so that's now my underlay and let's go back up to the cartography node there we go so you can see some of these patches that we see here um, in fact forget the 3d view keep an eye on this I'm gonna make this a bit bigger so you can see okay so these patches you see here the orange one here and here just keep an eye on those two and when we go to the previous mask you can see that's what's creating it so if I were to turn it off, there we go. The heights here and the heights here and all these different things here. We have shapes at different heights, but they're not like terraced or, um, you know, hard shapes. Um, they're soft. They kind of merge with each other. And there's this, this slight resemblance to the original shape because we do start with the original shape, but then it goes very different at different points because we have overlapping things. So now when we go back to cartography, you can see that's what's creating all these different, um, let me lower the exposure so it's a bit more visible. Um, there we go. So there, so that's what we're getting. So when we added the canyon, you can see the, the mineral map is kind of following the canyon shape, but at the same time doing its own slight variations here and there. Uh, the purlins that we brought in, like some of them are creating these shapes while merging with the main terrain, while the others, the stronger ones like this, are poking out and creating their own mineral patches. And then again, all the while kind of following whatever the original terrain dictates. Then we get towards the coastline, we can see different mineral patches. Uh, but because the, the lake was generated out of a canyonizer, we have a mask for that. And that mask is also affecting the, the mineral map. So somewhere here on the edges, we'll get a bit of this yellow bit. Uh, and um, everywhere else as well, it'll just kind of slightly follow the, the general shape. So you can see here, even though we have different minerals, it's still kind of following the general contour of this area. And so that's how you get these um, uh, mineral shapes. Now, uh, I have a simplified uh, turn to 10%. I think that's useful because when you look at geological maps, you know, they won't have the same level of detail that a 3D map would have for the exact precise pixel to pixel contour of the underlying terrain. So having a bit of simplification helps uh, makes it look more real like a, a real map would um, then I also have uh, I'm not processing the water here you can process the water if you want it's really shallow so I didn't really care about that um, in fact in, in some ways the, the white looks better like a real map uh, for at least for geology so for creating the different colors now this is a bit tough and um, after creating some of these maps, um, I know exactly what we'll do in the near future to make this easier. But you can go and assign different um, colors to some of these things. So you can just, right now, you'll just, you'll just have to eyeball it. Um, so if you have a, um, a tool like ShareX or something else where you have an eyedropper tool where you can reference a color on the screen, um, you can try to match the color from here and then just go through these to see which one it is. And so what I've done is I've changed all, um, well, not all, just a few, like this, 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 uh, a couple of them here, and the watercolor here, um, so that it looks more like the, the geological legend that you would find in a, in a map and not the standard um, cartography colors that you would see with the default node. And so that's giving us the general shape. Now cartography, again, like I said, it doesn't care what height you're giving it at least when shading is concerned because it's only using the height uh, and of course the lake outline to create the contour boundaries now for creating the actual um, uh, shaded map 
So I'm using the light node and I'm giving it the lake's output. So we're going to ignore what's coming in here completely. And so there. With that and the color output from cartography coming in, um, I have a high quality for everything. I found a nice angle that worked. Um, a little high ambient light. Air density in haze is low, but ozone layer thickness is high. So that gives us this nice um, bluish tone. And um, the sun angular diameter, which it practically translates to shadow softness in this case. So we have that high up, so it creates these nice soft shadows. Like it's a physical, um, like a, a model on a small scale map. And let me zoom out to there. And that's what's creating this terrain map. Well, terrain and map. So there you have it. As you can see, the, the, the whole thing is pretty simple. It's not that complex. And this entire graph takes like 59 seconds to build. So um, this whole method works. And again, since it's all procedural, move things about, it'll adapt. And so like I said, we could transform um, and there's that canyon mask that helps so much. So if I went to the transform node and let me zoom out here, I'm going to turn off the 2D view for now. So this is great here. Let's say I want it further down here for some reason. So, oh, that's too much. Maybe something like that. Oh yeah, I want it right there where the canyon ends. So then let's look at our final terrain. And so that's what our final terrain looks like. Similar but different, the lakes are now displaced. So if we go to color production, it'll now rebuild a bunch of these things. Lake in a moment. So there, this has changed. Uh, the general attributes still hold. In this case though, like I don't really like how these mineral patches look, but that's easy enough. We just go to Berlin and I'm just gonna change the seed. I'll try one more. These look a bit big. I'm gonna clip it just a bit to bring them down. And then let's see what that looks like. So there we have it now, the mineral map um, feels a bit different. Our mountain peak has all these different qualities now because of all the geology there. And then if I were to go back, let's see what the dead zones look like. Uh, it should be a pretty um, straightforward and fast process at this point. So you can see we're still getting the same stuff. Uh, height, flows, and so forth, and lake boundaries. And then uh, let's set up the vegetation and stuff so we can see. If I want things we're working on with Gaia 1.3 is when you're doing these things, the response time for all these nodes will be much better. In fact, some of the slower nodes will be like maybe um, it'll take half the time. In some cases, um, it even takes like a, a, a tenth of the time. So without the actual tree surfaces or the tree shapes visible, that's our new terrain. It looks kind of cool. And let's see if, if I were to bring in the trees. It's a bit dark because I had turned this down. There you go. And that's our updated terrain. And then just as easily, you could just randomize everything and get them something new. And of course, if you go back here to cartography, well, we're getting trees in here as well because the underlay is set here. So let's go to our generate the, the shaded texture map. There we go. Um, you'll notice this is a bit taller than it kind of should be. Um, 
Now let me change the underlay again because I was just getting some trees where they shouldn't be visible. So there, now, um, and, and that's our that's our journal map. And you said randomize, create different things, and uh, you can easily create lots of different kinds of maps. So I hope this has been useful and it'll give you lots of stuff to play with. And I uh, would love to see what you guys create. So uh, make sure you post in the group on Facebook and uh, uh, have fun. <laughs>